Okay, well, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Rajit for uh, inviting me. Uh, I would have been there in person, but it's a very long trip. Uh, I hear it's uh, about a 21, 22 hour flight. Is that, is that right? From uh, California to uh, uh, your location. But uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, conference. Uh, I looked at it, I, I feel very humbled looking at the uh, and all of the different presenters uh, that you have here because uh, it, it's uh, really uh, just uh, incredible that you, I feel that you've invited me. Um, I titled this for a couple of reasons. I knew the message that I wanted to get across, but I wasn't really sure how to do it. And I was hopeful that as being a keynote speaker, I, there wouldn't be any questions at the end. So <laughs> I hope that uh, we can, when we go through this, uh, you'll see uh, what my message is. And I would also hope that you already know many of the answers to the questions that I'm going to be posing to you, uh, because this is more uh, about uh, I guess a perception of how we view our discipline. A lot of this is how we view our discipline. And that's why I called it the wall of science, uh, because I think we all, all of us who are in the industry, in the discipline of science, have to be protective of our discipline. And, and to stand in front of that wall that is is necessary to uh, present the information that we have been asked to provide. So I'm going to try and walk th walk you through some of the, uh, I guess, the dichotomies that I see with us defending our science, uh, because I believe that we are in a dichotomy. What does science really know? And are we involved in science or do we also add a bit of art into our science? And, and how do we accept the influence of what I would call the politico when it, within the forensic science world? How do we stand up to, and I, I don't say politics, I really say the politico, everything that's involved with it, and I'll have an example of it towards the end. But let me pose a couple of questions to you. In the world of science, how much role of a role does chance play? Uh, and, and how much influence does that chance play as it relates to, to power? And can we, can we reason and, and use science to explain everything? And is there a room for accidents? Is there, is there time when we say, oh, we made a mistake? Can we explain everything as a, in terms of our role in science. Do we have a margin of error? Is there a margin of error in the world of science? And when we make a statement from our position of expertise, do we profess a moral certitude for our work? And are we excluding error from everything that we do. Uh, because sometimes it's very difficult to uh, defend if we make an error. How right do we have to be? And can we always back it up? If we say something is right, almost certainly we are right because we can back it up with our data, we can back it up with our research. But if we say something is impossible and not, we're not capable of looking into that, more than likely we could be wrong. 
because somebody else will always be looking at our science. Somebody will always be experimenting with our science. And, and so, yes, we can be right because we can back it up. But we could also be wrong if we think that we can't, how can I say this, um, reach into that area of unknown where we've got to uh, take a look at the things we don't know. When you think of science, it's a very simple definition. It's Latin for to know. It, it, it's our science is an ordered knowledge. It, it is a very distinct way of adopting our theories and put, putting them out front. Science is as much an agreement among many. We have to get some level of agreement among our peers. Science is not just one individual saying something. And I have to say, it's not consensus. It is science is not looking for consensus from our peers. It is much more than that. It's an agreement. And at the same time, we have to be skeptical of everything that we do in our, our business. We have to constantly challenge ourselves in terms of the message that we want to get across, the information that we provide as experts. Uh, so if you think about some guiding principles as, as we embrace the, the forensic science world, we can only, we cannot experiment with a lot of latitude. We have to be very careful of how we go about experimenting. We have to utilize some strict protocols, some procedures that we know work, and we have to carefully observe everything that we do whenever we quote experiment. It's not easy in our world of forensic science to experiment. We have to do it, I guess you'd say, behind closed doors. And, and, and behind the wall, if you will, because we, we have the reverence for the science. Not everybody does. We make incredible inroads every day when we do experiments, when we do validate, when we conduct our research, when we, when we come up with various theories that we go out to, uh, get acceptance from our peers. In all of this, we protect our science and make discoveries that will change or modify uh, what, we, what we are doing. I would have to say that there's two words in si that should never be placed in science, the politico and democracy have no place or position in our environment. It is not about being just politically or politico. It is not about democracy where everyone has a say. We've got to defend the science and, and, and be the wall of science and the way our world exists. There's, our world consists, the scientific forensic world consists of all of these things that I've put up here, principles. We are guided by some very serious principles in our discipline. We embrace principles where many other disciplines do not. 
we look at concepts and theories. We look at systems. We look at processes. And to a certain extent, we add the value system that the scientific community uh, uh, provides. So it's, it's these six elements that we have to defend every time we step out from the wall and talk about the sci science. So I want you to think that how important it is that we adhere to the principles, the concepts, the theories, the systems that we adhere to, the processes, and the values at each and every turn, and how much we need to protect, protect them. We don't, we don't subscribe to this formula where we would take a method that is clearly wrong to try and manipulate it to a correct answer because that's bad science. Wrong methods, trying to reach a correct answer is bad science. And, and that formula doesn't work any, and has no place in our business. It's our responsibility to stand up for the principles, concepts, theories, systems, process, and values for that moment when a new policy may come along from the Politico. You and I serve a higher master, a higher authority than the Politico or the democracy. And we're driven by a constancy, constancy of, of purpose, not notions. We, we don't have uh, uh, intuition, if you will. Uh, we, are, we recognize that our expertise is indispensable. And we stand in front of the wall of science to dispense our knowledge. And, and like I said in, in my opening statement, that I know you know this already, but sometimes we don't put it in front as much as we should. But at the same time, we see every day that science may not be the only truth. I would suggest that we may have divine intervention at times to prove something. There are still mysteries out there that can't be substantiated by science. There are even miracles that can't be substantiated by science. There's coincidences and there's that inexplainable, that's an inability to explain something out there that we can't always rely on science to support. I wanna give you an example of, of what I'm saying. I, I have no technical automotive skills. I do not, I, I'm not mechanically inclined and if I need something, I go to a place that stores that knowledge, has the parts, the technical abilities to install, remove, or replace something. I tell them what I need, and I may take my card, and, and they tell me to return later. They, they tell me to come back when it's fixed. I return, I pick up my car, and they have it repaired. I don't go to their laboratory or their work bay and watch them do what they do. I don't tell them how to pull one part out and replace it with another. I tell them I want a positive outcome, a car that functions. It's their principles, their concepts, it's their systems and theories 
of how they do business that are theirs. I cannot possibly influence the outcome. If I tried to influence how they did their job, I might get my way, but I might not get my car fixed <laughs> the way it should be. They have the strong arm of technical science on their side of the wall, and they keep it there. Their knowledge and expertise are their power. So they embrace their sound principles, their concepts, their systems, their theories, and perhaps even their values, and that becomes their power. And I can't have, I cannot make an attempt to influence the outcome. So when we talk about expertise, it is indispensable. But at the same time, we have to stand firm that we are, are uh, have committed to our science and we'll deliver, but we have to deliver it on our terms. I wanna talk for a minute about the influence of public policy on science. Uh, as you saw in my opening, I, ha I have a, a doctoral degree in public policy and, and I was always uh, involved with it for four years uh, going through the school. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, public policy doesn't influence science or should not. It should be just the other way around. Science should influence public policy. We start many times with bad science. We have ineffective policies that start and end with bad science through the use of data that has been manipulated by others used expressly to support a position, what would be a correct position. Sometimes it's used to attack. There's a, a concept called rubber coordinates and essentially what that really means is that we massage or manipulate data to fit the desired outcome or conclusion. And that gets back to the issue of should public policy influence science or should, let me get this right, should science influence public policy? And, and I'll go out on a limb here and just say, science should be the one influencing public policy and not the other way around. We have a utility factor here with science. We, we, we're we used as, as professionals to prove that something is either working or not working. We have our own language that helps us interpret things. And, and we use science to create movement away or towards a goal and, and change direction. We use science to show that there's a problem. We use science to identify an entity, to discover something new, that clearly there is so much pleasure in finding things out. Uh, there's a book out, uh, which I'd strongly recommend. It's, it's by a gentleman by the name of Richard Feynman. And he wrote a he wrote a book, he's a uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist. And believe me, I'm not a scientist in that field at all. I have no uh, grasp of physics for the most part. But the title of his book was very profound. And, and it really sends a message that there is 
there is satisfaction in finding things out. There is pleasure in finding things out. He says in, his, in the basis of his book, I never think I know the answer. I always let the science lead me to the answer. So we do help. We use science to create those natural and artificial groups to use for whatever purpose we do. We use science to identify and distinguish one thing from another. We try to use science for, to make sense of the chaos that's out there. And, and believe me, there's a lot of chaos out there and, and the reward for people who can make sense of chaos is what we are after. Our goal is, is that we as, uh, as uh, either social science, forensic science, is that we thrive on chaos because we have the instruments to make sense of the chaos and to explain the unexplainable. We also use science to set cutoffs and achieve goals. We have cutoffs so we say, okay, in science, it is 400 milligrams for this, that, and the other to be a positive result. So we use science a lot to establish those. And we also use it to identify what to change. If, if we can go into uh, uh, a study and examine it and determine that something needs to be changed, we use the basis of science to do that. Unfortunately, sometimes we also use it to create pressure and to establish a norm. We look for the highs. We look for the lows. Sometimes the high is good. Sometimes the high is bad. Sometimes the low is good. Sometimes the low is bad. So we're always looking for the frequency to do some, how many times does this occur? Is this an anomaly? Is this a rarity? Is there a way to uh, differentiate between uh, what we're saying is frequent or rare? We use it to create groups and set up groups. This group is A, this group is B, this group is C. We use science sometimes to notice something more, to recognize, hey, pay attention to this. We don't know everything about it, but let's pay attention to it. We use science to select and choose. We use science to identify differences. This is different than that. This is similar to that. So we, we use science for a lot of different way, different methods to explain things in the world, whether it's in the world of forensics, whether it's in the world of physical science, or whether it's in the world of social science. So there's a lot of human factors when we look at science. So I ask you these questions. What do you measure or use as your template? And all of that is behind the wall. You have a template. How do you measure? How do you use it? Who decides what to measure or assess? Do you decide or is there a principle or theory that has already been established that makes that decision for you? And for how long? How long do we study something? Do we only take a snapshot at the beginning? Do we take a, some, measure something in the middle or the end? When do we measure? How long is, uh, 
there's a lot of discussion about uh, global warming and all that. But at the same time, there are scientists that say we measure weather from 172 year uh, latitude, not by a 10 year latitude. So when you look at 172 years, the measurement is different than if we looked at it for 10. So what are the standards that are applied to the way we measure? All of that has to be delineated. All of that has to be examined. And who decides what to include and what to exclude? We can always defend, say, oh, we included everything in this factor. But not always. We can always, but we have to defend when we make an exclusion. We didn't add that into our decision making process or into our formula or theory. We excluded that. And here's the reason why. What do we ignore? Is there a number where we're comfortable? You know, somebody said that. A majority is 50 plus a feather. 51% plus a feather is a majority. Is there a number where we're com comfortable with whenever we uh, want to go out and measure something? And is that criteria agreed upon? I want to talk about a case study and then I'll close uh, if you don't mind. I, I know I've kind of gone on and on, but I want to give you a case study example of, of what we're talking about. A little background. There's a, there was a case many years ago of a double homicide, a murder that received a lot of attention. And as a result of all that attention, uh, it became a very lengthy trial. The results were that the defendant was deemed not guilty. Fast forward a couple of years and there was a civil trial. And in a civil trial, the case was, uh, was more a preponderance of evidence than it was a reasonable doubt. And the person who was found guilty in a civil court. The award or the, the person that sued the arrestee were the parents of one of the victims. The jury awarded $20 million to the parent. The arrestee did not have the wherewithal to pay that $20 million. Uh, he did have a a small pension that was, but that was protected and it was not subject to the rules. He had no other income. And if he did have any income, the court said that the family would get it. So up to recently, the family was able to recover only $200,000 of the the uh, $20 million award. Fast forward a few years. And as you know, we mentioned in my bio about the Bulmer Institute and uh, I ran a uh, polygraph school under the auspices of the American Polygraph Association. And in doing that, while we were doing that, we were approached by a Hollywood producer with an offer. His offer was that he wanted to take the arrestee, the person that was the suspect of the double murder, and have him take a polygraph on live television and be able to show on live television the results. 
the family of the deceased would receive $7 million from it. They would do a pay-per-view, advertise it for six months, similar to a, 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 a major boxing match. And their projection was that they could make easily 15 to $20 million with a worldwide uh, view of this particular celebrity taking a polygraph live on television. So the question became, how much was enough and was it worth the risk? The question became, because they offered my institute $100,000 to present, to utilize the best polygraph examiner we could use to test this particular celebrity. But I pose the question to you, who was really on trial here? Who was really on trial here? It was the science of polygraph that was on trial. What were the potential outcomes? The potential outcomes were that it would show that he was innocent. The potential outcome would be that it would show that he was guilty. Or the potential outcome would be that it was inconclusive and we would not know. So who makes those decisions? Do we let Hollywood make those decisions? Uh, is, is there an outcome that everybody would accept? Where does the expertise lie? The expertise lies in the examiner, in, in the science. And, and so whose principles, whose concepts, whose systems, whose processes, whose values and theories are being tested? The candidate, the arrestee already has a certain set of values and they've been on display. So, do we have a margin of error with polygraph? Do we have a margin of error with silence? Science. I will tell you uh, that we did not accept that offer because we did not want science to be showcased in a political environment, in an environment where uh, the science could not be protected. And so we made the decision to not participate. And when you look back, we say, oh, gee, we could have gotten the family $7 million for that. Well, we, our first commitment had to be to the science. So some closing thoughts. I think we all have an obligation to protect the wall. You're the keeper of our knowledge base, each and every one of you that are out there. I would ask that you commit yourself to our principles, to our, to our theories, to our concepts, to the systems that we use, the processes that we apply, and your own personal and professional values. And most importantly, challenge your own theories without the influence of democracy or the politico. And I think we will all be better off if we put science at the forefront and we become the wall that protects the science. And I hope I got my message across, Ranji. I hope I did. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Yes, sir.